Punjabali, an artist, designer, an animal, and an ambassador of one of the most dangerous species on Earth. Human-centric thinking is causing us to damage our planet and the other forms of life in ways that can't be repaired. Every nine minutes, one species on this planet disappears forever. This astonishing chart shows there are only 4% of wild mammals left on Earth among all mammals. As the Anthropocene rampages, our challenge for the next decade will be to reimagine how we live through the lens of the environment, to shift our perspectives from human-centered, egocentric, profit-driven, post-industrialist thinking to a multi-species, ecocentric worldview. And this requires a fundamental perception change, rewiring our views of nature and hierarchies of intelligence. Through co-creation with non-humans, I can tap into their wonders and needs, create an artifact of empathy that I can share with the world, with those who haven't met these creatures. During the pandemic, I had the privilege to live in the furthest parts of U.S., spending time with animals and glaciers to understand their beauty, wonder, and preciousness. Today, I would like to share with you how co-creating with the squid and octopus and glaciers shaped my ecocentric worldview. Last year, I worked with a marine biology lab in Hawaii. While the scientists were studying the squid, I noticed the squid just sitting in these white, boring tanks all day long. I wonder if I could make their environment more interesting by building a playground for them. I collected the white sand and black sand from Hawaii Islands and make them into the shapes of different countries. He was living in there. He carries the sand from one side to the other and spreads it around. He swims back and forth between the countries across the borders without the need of a visa or a passport. He buries himself uh, under the sand and then uses this cute little tentacles to push the sand on his face as a camouflage. Watching the squids reminds me of myself in many ways as an immigrant, moving between China and U.S., carrying the baggage of two cultures, trying to assimilate to blend in, and found myself in the situation like the squid here. He has white sand on his body, but black sand on the top, sitting in the black, surrounded by white sand, but feeling perfectly camouflaged. Can you find where he is? He is right there eyes bulging out of the sand. We build borders between our countries that can block natural animal migrations. Animals that would not care about the delineation between countries are forced to recognize the difference and take a side. After one month, the squid completely reinterprets our human-made borders and maps. From the squid's perspective, the map that humans have repetitively fought wars for in the eyes of the squid are drawn on their own terms. While in Hawaii, I get to spend time with an octopus. On the evolutionary tree, humans and octopuses are separated by 500 million years of evolution. And they've evolved distributed intelligence into a completely different extreme than humans. So I wonder, what if the world is not centered around humans but octopus. We imagine a world where global warming causes sea levels to rise and all continents are submerged underwater. And as a highly intelligent species in the ocean, the octopus have unlocked the optical gene that releases this self-destructing hormone after giving birth. Now they can pass on their wisdom from generation to generation. The Anthropocene ends and the world enters Stolocene. While humans are on the edge of causing our own extinction, how can we design an elegant extinction? What can we create so that the upcoming species, in, the ca in this case, the octopus, can remember us with some tenderness and empathy? In this first attempt, we try to connect with octopus by learning their movements through interspecies metamorphosis, shifting from humans to promising world will to a world where we have to adapt and learn the becoming of other species, shifting from central governed brain to distributed intelligence, and shifting from our visual-dominated field 
to tactile perception. We also wonder what this world will be like through the octopus perception. Maybe there are bell engineers, the humans in, with enlarged organs trying to survive and adapt in the world and the water. Maybe there are octopus archaeologists trying to scan through the reminiscence of the Anthropocene. Maybe there are territorial birds. They will try to take advantage of their aerial ability when the land is underwater. And you may know that each of octopus tentacle can think on its own. Here are three octopuses trying to express their opinions. It's hard because the tentacle from the same octopus may disagree with each other. Not only octopus have distributed intelligence. I see another form in how ecosystems respond to changes in their environment, like glaciers. Glaciers have birth and death, they grow, they store memories in ice cores, and transform throughout their lifetimes. I wanted to co-create with these mighty beings, so I moved to Alaska to work with glaciers. I have learned from glaciologists and the Alaskan community about the exponential retreat of glaciers over the past century. This is what McCarthy Glacier and Moore Glacier look like in 1909 and 1941. By 2004, you can barely see their faces. I collaborate with scientists to turn the esoteric climate change graphs and numbers into empathetic and tangible narratives to challenge the audience with the intricate beauty and irreversible change of nature. I use data from glacier melting in the past 60 years to compose music and dance with local musicians who have witnessed the recession of the Mendenhall Glacier over their lifetime. Here, the glacier's own sound, the melting data, and the performer's lived experience meld into Glacier's Lament. In Disappearing Blue, there are four color cards in Pantone color for, for the Glacier Blue. But in real glaciers, this blue is variable and dynamic. As glaciers are disappearing, this unique blue is also disappearing. I sampled and blended the color from the glaciers in Alaska and hung them in museums with mountain glacier river inside. When one glacial calving happened on the Mendenhall Glacier, one color well falls down. At the end of the exhibition, all the 60 tubes fall down, forming a painting on the canvas beneath. In one of my glacier expeditions, I took home a glacier ice in a like, futile attempt to try to save one piece of glacier before it disappears. I try to grow the glacier by watering it in the freezer. I listened to the ice closely and heard a whole forest of sound in it. So I decided to make a virtual reality film to tell the story with the sound from that glacier. Once a glacier tells the story of a girl and her relationship with a piece of glacier ice, as the girl grows older, the existence of the ice is threatened. And the viewer is taking on this seemingly futile efforts for her to try to protect what was once a glacier. In Inupiaq tradition, glaciers carry memories from the past and communicate them through their songs. The climate crisis has become a terrifying reality that includes seeing the end of glaciers. The end of these song histories happen right before our eyes. While we were recording the sound in Alaska, I wasn't able to find the words in English or Chinese to describe this chirping sound you're hearing right now. It's not forest, it's not bird, it's simply just bursting bubble under the sun. And then I learned that in the local indigenous culture's language, Tagish, both is the name of their tribe and means the sound of the breakup of ice. We further developed into a live performance. Augmented with motion capture, the dancer embodies the glacier, chasing the memory of glacier from Ice Age to Anthropocene through her ice core. The audience confront the birth and death of glacier through the girl's point of view. This was a one day long installation on Matanuska Glacier. I placed the mirror on the lake facing the glacier, as if it's saying, this was me. I place the mirror on the glacier, facing the lake, as if saying, this is my future. 
There are numerous types of intelligence beyond human intelligence, such as distributed intelligence of octopus, swarm intelligence of ants, bees, birds, collective intelligence of mycelium, and microbial intelligence. Co-create with non-human species help us to probe into different intelligences, shift perspectives, and interrogate ourselves. If the entire world is a projection of our perception, how do we see the world from a cephalobot perspective? What can we create from that perspective? What can we co-design together with and for them? To collaborate, we need to go beyond passive looking and deeply understand the non-human intelligence, behavior, and agency. We need to respect, learn, connect, share the umwelt, exchange senses, and be like each other. Finding connections reveals how we are part of the many continuums of intelligences. And doing this research is an immensely enlightening adventure. It gives me the time to actually think and breathe with another species and having moments like this. And let's try this at home. Um, Co-create something with another being. Recognize the other intelligence in your world. It can be a forest near your home, your pet, or even a spider in the corner of your room. Send me what you have. We've created a lot of things for humans. And even by just taking a small portion of our limited attention to create for all, we will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.